This question has appeared on a couple of earlier videos which explain how to get data from a closed Excel workbook using ActiveX data objects. So to answer the question in today's video, I'm going to assume that you already know how to do that part. And if not, then this is the video that you need to begin with, how to get data from a closed Excel file using VBA. Assuming that you do know that part already, here's the setup for today's question. I've got a basically blank workbook, it's saved as a macro enabled workbook, and we're going to extract data from another workbook and paste it into this blank sheet one. The workbook containing all the data is called movies.xlsx, and that's just got a single worksheet called sheet one with several columns containing information about films. I'm just going to close down the movies workbook. It doesn't need to be open to extract information from it. Now I've already got a bunch of code in the um, blank workbook, which is going to extract the information into sheet one, starting at cell A2. So just to show you that code to start with, let's head to the Visual Basic Editor. And there's a module one in there, which I can double click on to open up. I'll drop a link in the video description so that you can download this starting file. So if you've watched the previous videos, you'll be fairly familiar with this basic code by now. I have set a reference to the ActiveX data objects library. So from tools references, I've referenced Microsoft ActiveX data objects 6.1. I've created a connection and a record set object, a simple instruction to clear everything from sheet one each time we run this code, created a connection to the movies workbook sitting in the same folder as this one. So those are the two files we're working with. Then I've opened the connection, created a record set, selected everything from sheet one, so the asterisk symbol there represents all columns, opened the record set and then copied everything into cell A2 on sheet one. So the basic end result of this when I run the subroutine is back in my what was a previously blank worksheet is all of the data from the movies workbook from sheet one, just lacking the column headings. We actually have a couple of different options for extracting the field names from the record set. For the first example, I'm just going to count through the fields collection, writing out the name property of each field into the top row of the worksheet. To do that, I can head back to the Visual Basic Editor, and then at the top of the subroutine, I can declare a variable to keep track of the number of the field that I'm looking at. So something simple like dim i as integer. I can then scroll down to where I've just opened up the record set, and then I can loop through the fields collection by counting through it. So I can say for i equals, then I need the number of the first item in the fields collection. The fields collection happens to be indexed from zero. So the first item is numbered zero. And then the top item, well, I don't know how many columns I've selected. I've used select asterisk select all here. So I don't know how many columns I'm going to get. So one way to calculate that is to refer to the count property of the fields collection of the record set object. So I can say for i equals zero to rs.fields.count. Now the count property tells me how many items there are. The highest numbered item in the collection will be one less than that because the counting begins from zero. So I need to subtract one from the result of the count property to return the number of the last item. I can then give myself a couple of blank lines and say next i, and that sets up the basic loop that will count through the fields collection. Before we attempt to write out the field names into the worksheet, it might be worthwhile listing them to the immediate window just to check that we're returning the set of columns we expect. To do that, we can add a debug.print statement to our for loop, so we can say debug.print and then we need to refer to the particular field whose name we want to print out. We have a couple of different syntaxes we can use to do that. I could, in a very shorthand simplistic way, say rs, and then open some round brackets, and then simply pass in the index number of the field whose name I want to return. You can see there from the tooltip that if you pass in an index, it returns a reference as a field class. So I can say rs i, close the round brackets, and then refer to the name property of that field object. If I then run the subroutine, we'll see, we get a list of field names appearing in the immediate window, hopefully the ones we expect, and we could open up the movies workbook just to check. 
A slightly longer way of referring to the name property of a particular field is not to rely on the default property of the record set object. We can be a little more explicit about that. So we could say rs.fields, open some round brackets, and then once again the tooltip reads the same way. We've got the, um, the field class being returned or an object of the field class being returned by that particular property. So we can say fields and then pass in the index number again and then the name property of that. If we run the subroutine again, we'll see the same list of field names appears and you'll see we get the full list from film ID all the way to Oscar wins. Next, we simply need to write the field name into the appropriate cell in the worksheet. And again, we have several different choices for how we can do this. Here's a nice technique that relies on the index number that we're using to count through the fields collection. Let's change dbook.print to refer to the worksheet that we want to write our data into. So that's sheet one, I'm just using its code name here. Dot cells, and then we can refer to the row index and the column index just using some numbers. So the row index, if I want the titles to appear in row number one, the row index will be one. And then the column index will be the value of i plus one. So I can say i plus one. So the first cell that I'll reference there will be on row one and column zero plus one. So cell A1, basically. I then want to set the value property of that cell to be equal to the name property of that field. So having done that, if I run the subroutine now, have a look back at the Excel worksheet, I now have my column names listed at the top. There is an alternative way to loop through the fields collection in the record set. If you're familiar with objects and collections in VBA, you may well have used a for each loop in the past. So we could use a for each loop to process this fields collection. If I click on the word fields and press control I on the keyboard, that will bring up my quick information. So it says the fields property returns a reference to, a, to an object of the fields class. If I click inside the round brackets, it will tell me that the item property of the fields collection returns a reference to a field class or an object of the field class. So I could write a for each loop using a variable which holds a reference to a field object and loop through the fields collection. To make that work, what I'd ordinarily do is declare a variable of the field class. So I'd probably say something like dim f as adodb.field. But annoyingly, you'll find that the field class, if you reference the ActiveX Data Object 6.1 library, the field class doesn't appear to exist. It is not in this list at all. You can just ignore this IntelliSense list for the moment. I've typed in the word field in lowercase letters. If I just press escape to abandon this IntelliSense list, if I click onto the next row down or any other row than the line I'm writing, you'll see that the lowercase f gets capitalized. That's a good clue that there is actually a field class in the libraries we've referenced. I'll get onto why it doesn't appear in the list in just a moment. So dim f as adodb.field. I'm then just going to scroll down to where my for next loop is sitting, highlight those three lines of code, and then comment them out. Then below that, I'm going to write a for each loop. So I can say for each f in rs.fields. A couple of blank lines and then say next f. And that type of loop will automatically set this f variable to refer to each instance of a field object in that fields collection. So again, just as a very quick sense check, we can say debug.print f dot name. And I'll just clear the content of the immediate window at that point. So I'll highlight everything and clear it all out and then run the subroutine again. And we'll see that exact same list of field names appears in the immediate window. So why doesn't the field class appear in the IntelliSense when we declare our variable? It certainly should do, and the fact that our code works when we run it is a very good clue that that field class definitely exists. If I head to the view menu and choose object browser, this is like the built-in dictionary of all the words that are defined in all the libraries you currently have referenced. 
I'm just going to limit this list to showing only the items defined in the ADODB library or the ActiveX Data Objects library. So I'll select ADODB from that list. Field clearly does not appear in this list at all, although I will find references to a field object or a field class by looking at some of the other properties and methods and other classes. If I select record set, for example, the list on the right hand side shows me the fields property, so I can select the fields property. And then in the little panel at the bottom, it tells me that the fields property returns a reference to a fields class or an object of the fields class. But fields is not listed in this list. If I click fields, it then says I can't jump to fields because it's hidden. So ordinarily, clicking on that item there would automatically select the object in this list so that I could see what methods and properties it has. But that's a good clue. If the fields class is hidden, I can unhide it. And I can do that in a couple of different ways. I can right click on either the, uh, the classes list on the left hand side or into this window on the right. And if I simply choose show hidden members, then all of a sudden I get lots of extra options available in this list which previously weren't displayed. So you might be able to make out the word fields there highlighted. If I select the fields property of the record set class and then hit the fields link here, it will, will then jump to and select the fields class in the list on the left hand side, showing me all of its methods and properties. There's an item property in there which returns a reference to an item of a field class. And if I select the field class, you can see that it's selected there in the list of classes. And those are all the methods and properties. You'll also notice a bunch of other versions of the field class, deprecated versions from previous versions of the ActiveX Data Objects library. You may remember if you've set a reference to the ActiveX Data Objects library yourself, then there are several different versions of that library. And if I scroll down far enough in this list, there you go. There's, uh, there's the previous versions of that library. So I'm not quite sure why they decided to hide the field and fields classes from the, um, from the ActiveX Data Object 6.1 library. I, I can only assume that it was, was a mistake. Um, they clearly should be available, shouldn't they? Now that you've unhidden these classes and other methods and properties in the object browser, if I close down the object browser and head back to this line of code where I declared my variable, if I say adodb, adodb dot, I will now find that field appears in the list along with all of the other hidden members. Um, I'm not sure this is a good way to program with all the deprecated objects still available. So I could select it from that list. It will make no difference to the way the code runs if I just clear the contents of the immediate window and then run the subroutine again. I get the same list of field names. But I can do that whether the class is hidden or not. It really doesn't make that much difference. I really would like to know why that's the case. So I'm just going to switch back to the object browser and then right click and uncheck the option to show hidden members. If anybody happens to know the answer to this, why the field and fields classes are hidden in this version of the ActiveX Data Objects library, I would love to know. But that's why it doesn't appear in the IntelliSense, because it's a hidden member in the ActiveX Data Objects library. Just to complete this for each loop then, we need to write out the field name into the worksheet. Currently, we're getting the list of data, but without the column headings again. Probably the simplest way to make this work is to make use of the integer variable, but this time, annoyingly, we have to manually increment it. So inside the for each loop, the first thing I would do is say i equals i plus 1. Then I can simply copy and paste the sheet 1.cells, 1 comma, and I'll just make a quick adjustment to that in a moment, dot value equals, and then I'll replace the debug dot print statement and then I just want to make sure that I'm referencing the value of i rather than i plus 1 because I've already incremented i the first in the first instruction in the loop. So the end result of all that, if I run the subroutine again, is the field names get written out into the same positions as with the for next loop. One nice thing about using either of the two techniques we've looked at is that it responds to which columns you've selected in the select list, which populates the record set. 
So when we're using select asterisk to get all the columns, then we get all the column names. But if we took away the asterisk and referred to some specific column names, I'll write these in some square brackets. So I've got title, comma, and then I could pick any of the other column names from this list. If there is a space in the column name, it must be wrapped in square brackets. So if I said runtime, for example, then I couldn't omit the square brackets from that. Title would work without the square brackets wrapped around it. After runtime, I could add one more column. Let's go for the genre column. And then if I were to run the subroutine this time, we'll see that the loop which loops through the column names only finds the column names in the record set that we've populated. Just as one final potentially useful piece of information, what if you didn't know which column names were available in the workbook you were connecting to? Well, we can find out. Let's head back to the Visual Basic Editor. I'm just going to copy the entire existing subroutine, and then I'm going to paste that in at the top of the module, and then I'll need to change its name, of course. We can't have two subroutines with the same name. Let's call this one Get Column Names from Closed Workbook. So Get Column Names from closed workbook. I'll stick with the same variables, but I'll make a few changes to the way my record set works. I'm not going to use rs.open, rs.source, or rs.activeConnection. I'm going to take away those lines altogether. And then I'm not going to use a new adodb record set. I'm going to set this record set to be equal to cn.openschema. Schemas are things which give you information about the structure of the file or the database that you're connecting to. And one of the schemas you can select from is AD schema columns. So I'm going to use AD schema columns and close the round brackets. You can just see hopefully at the end of the tooltip there that this method returns its reference as an object of the record set class. So it's an alternative way to populate a record set. So I'll close the round brackets. I can still loop through the fields collection of the record set, and I think that's a potentially useful thing to do so we can find out which column names exist in the schema which returns the column names um, of the workbook. And yep, we'll, uh, we'll write those column names out into the top row, printing the entire contents of the record set from cell A2. So having done that, we can run the subroutine and then looking back at sheet one now, it shows us a list of all of the table names, which in an Excel workbook is a list of all of the worksheets or all of the named ranges and which column names belong to the range or the worksheet that we've referred to. So a quick way to find out which column names are available just to help you write the queries when you're selecting information from the workbook. So there we go, that's how we return a list of column names from a record set when we're connecting to an Excel workbook. Hope you found that one useful. Thanks for watching. See you next time.